Psalms 122, verse 1. Is this on? Yeah. Can anybody hear me? There you go. What does it say? It says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Amen? Amen. This is such a privilege, such a blessing to be in the house of God today on this Holy Sabbath day. You know, we have brothers and sisters all over the country and all around the world that can't do what we're doing today. They don't have the freedom to do what we're doing today. This is a special time. And God has blessed us. And that promise that, uh, that text that uh, Ray read, when the Son of God makes you free, you will be free indeed. Who came up with this idea of freedom? God did. Jesus made everything that was made, including our freedom. That is a God-given blessing. And it says here from our, our dear prophet, Ellen G. White, the testimony of Jesus. And this is what this is about today. Conscience. Liberty of conscience. Religious liberty. In matters of conscience, the soul must be left untrammeled. No one is to control another's mind to judge for another or, or to prescribe his duty. God gives to every soul freedom to think and to follow his own convictions. Amen. And so, how in the world did the Adventist Church ever get involved with religious liberty? And, uh, and what is our history? This is not a sermon sermon, by the way. This is more of me just sharing with you our history. Ellen White tells us again, that we have nothing to fear for the future except we forget how God has led us in the past. And what else? And his teachings. So we can learn from the past. Have we made any mistakes? We have. And uh, has God taught us through those mistakes? Yes. Does he still want to teach us? Absolutely. And so the organization, the work of the Adventist Church, and the idea of religious liberty, is something that we're going to look at today, in terms of our history. Now, we've been called people of the book. You ever hear that before? Adventists are called people of the book. But we're also people that are in the book. Yes. We're in the book as well. Not to say that in a proud, boastful way, but the Bible uh, prophesies that the world would come to an end, that we are living in the time of the end. You can find this in Daniel 2, Daniel 7, Daniel 8, Daniel 11, Daniel 12. Revelation 11, 12, 13, 14, 17, and 18. And we're all in those pages. This country was prophesied to come into existence thousands of years ago. There's a big fuss right now about who started this country, who built the country. Well, let me just say, excuse me for the Lord. He's the one that said this country was going to come into existence. This is his idea. It's not man's. There's no glory in any of us. The only reason why we're here is because God wants us to be here. Because God opened this up. And so that's what this is all about. So it's interesting that the United States and Adventism are running side by side and they merge together at the end of time. The United States came into existence at the end of time. 1776 is when the Declaration of Independence was written. Well, guess what happened? The time of the end came in 1798, when the, when the beast received the deadly wound. And guess who was on the ground at that time in 1798? William Miller. And William Miller was in the Revolutionary War, the, the last phase of it in 1812. By 1815, he was studying the Bible. By 1818, he saw Daniel 8.14. And he saw the 2300 days... And the end of the world was supposed to happen at that time. That's what his understanding was, and he wasn't that far off. Because Jesus did want to come at the end of the 2300 days. So here we are, 2021. Why are we still here? See, that's the question we have to ask ourselves. Jesus wants to come. There's multiple statements that I could show you at another time where Sister White and the Bible clearly says Jesus could have come, could have come from the 1850s all the way to 1911. Do you think he wants to come today? Yes. In our Sabbath school class, we were talking about Isaiah 40. Comfort ye, comfort ye my people. 
What that context of that statement, those texts were in the context of them going into, into captivity. Are we in a version of captivity right now? Is this country the same as it was a year and a half ago? No. We have less freedom today than we had before. But nevertheless, God wants to comfort us. In spite of the fact that we're going to lose our freedoms, there's something we can do about it. There's something that can be done about it. And our history shows that Adventists did do something about it when there was a lockdown coming of gigantic biblical proportions in the time of Jones and Wagner and Ellen White in the 1880s and 1890s. Darkness was coming upon this country and the world at the same time the latter rain was beginning to fall. All happening at the same time. Darkness and light happening simultaneously. And we're going to look at some of this and review some of our history. The National Religious Liberty Association is an Adventist group that was organized in Battle Creek, Michigan on the evening of, of uh, July 21st, 1889. Its purpose was well summed up by the president at the first annual session that was held that same year. Now let's see, I think, is this the, uh, is this the one that first studied? This is, this is, okay. I think this is uh, the second study, but that's okay. A few men, this is uh, George Butler, has said, believing in civil religious liberty organized for the purpose of combating everything and everything, anything and everything that has a tendency toward uniting church and state, the animating principle of the organization was no new one to Seventh-day Adventists. Adventists were not occupying new ground in opposing religious legislation. It was a development which their views of prophecy led them to expect. Already in the middle of the 19th century, years before the Blair Sunday Bill or any similar piece of legislation had been brought before Congress, Adventists had taken their position based on the prophecies of Revelation 13, verses 11 through 17, that there would arise here in the United States an intolerant hierarchy similar to the papacy of the Middle Ages, which, taking advantage of certain circumstances, customs, and prejudices, would seize upon the civil government, power of the civil government, and use it for its accomplishments, and of its own ends. Hence, the organization of the National Reform Association, followed by other developments looking in the same direction, and especially persistent efforts to induce Congress to subvert the principles of the National Constitution, together with the manifestations of intolerance and persecution in a number of states, all seem to demand that some steps be taken to meet the issue and to make the most of the opportunity of warning the people of the impending danger. And so, the immediate cause of the organization of the Religious Liberty Association was rapidly increasing activities not only of the national reformers, but of other certain religious organizations having their aim and purpose to commit to the United States to religious legislation. Efforts in this direction were made early in the history of the Republic. Okay, so 1776 was when the Declaration of Independence was signed. And then in the 1780s came the Constitution. Well, look what happened. By 1811 already, the ink was barely dry on the Constitution. The Synod of Pittsburgh was petitioning Congress to prohibit mail stages from traveling on Sunday and to close the post offices on that day. In the following year, 1812, the General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church sent in a petition to the same effect. Similar requests and petitions came from various sources in the course of the next few years, and in early 1830, the time seemed opportune for some kind of answer and Colonel Richard Johnson of Kentucky, then serving as chairman of the House of Committee on Post Offices, made a statement of the principles that were involved, and he said that the report went on to the point, out of the limitations of Congress in dealing with such matters. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. But you can see, 
things were already taking place. The lamb, the animal that came out of Revelation 13 that has the two lamb-like horns. What do those two lamb-like horns stand for? Is that nice? We should know this. Civil liberty, religious liberty. That's right. Why lamb-like? Because they're from heaven. They were lamb-like. They're like Jesus. They're from God. They're from principles of, of the kingdom of God. In the kingdom of God, there is religious liberty and civil liberty. Again, who created liberty? God did. Amen. It comes from Him. Everything about reality comes from God. Our fingers, our eyes, our freedom, the way we are shaped, our hearts, our, everything comes from the Lord. The seven-day week cycle. Everything you can imagine. Family. God's order. Everything is created by Him. And liberty is one of the greatest things that God has ever given to any of His creatures. And so, there was a push to take that liberty away. In the early 1800s already. William Miller, 1811, is just getting started. See, Satan wants to attack and shut things down before they even get developed. But God intervened with this man here. And it says, Congress acts under a constitution of delegated and limited powers. Among the few prohibitions which it contains is one that prohibits a religious test. And another which declares that Congress shall pass no law respecting the establishment of religion. Or, here's the one that we're dealing with today, prohibiting the free exercise thereof. In the days of Jones and Wagner and the pioneers, it was, a, it was to establish a religion, but the First Amendment has two prongs to it. It's not establishing a religion, a union of church and state, or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. These two things are given to us by our Creator. Okay? This is from God. This is not from man. That's what Thomas Jefferson said in the Declaration of Independence. You got those two horns. One is religious and one is civil. The religious one has the first angel's message in it. Who do we worship? God. Who did what? Created everything that there is. Isn't that right? He's the creator. Yes. What does Tom Je Thomas Jefferson say in the Declaration of Independence? That the creator has granted us these inalienable rights. There's a civil horn, the civil liberty, giving also its first angel's message version saying the exact same thing. So freedom of conscience, both in religion and in civil liberty, comes from God. Amen. They're both from God. The first horn has to do with the first four commandments. The second horn has to do with the other six commandments. Yes. See? Those are their dignity. But that is what represents the law of God. These two horns represent the law of God. Do we see any of them being attacked? In the time of Jones and Wagner, the first horn, the religious horn, was under attack. In the days in which we're living, the second, the civil horn, is being under attack right now. And if we're not, if we're paying attention. Or prohibiting the free exercise. This, this brother was sharing this. This comprehensive statement of the fundamental principles given gave a temporary quietus to the attempts to commit Congress to religious legislation. Some years were to elapse before the question would be generally agitated again. What happened? 1863. What happened in 1863? An organization called the National Reform Association, whose avowed purpose, as stated in Article 2 of its Constitution, was to do this. Quote, to secure such an amendment to the Constitution of the United States as will declare that the nation's allegiance to Jesus Christ and its acceptance of the moral laws of the Christian religion and so indicate that this is a Christian nation and place all the Christian laws, institutions, and the usages of our government on an undeniably legal basis in the fundamental law of the land. Again, uniting church and state. What else happened in 1863? Uh, yeah, Adventist no? church. Yeah, church was also organized officially. No, it was already on the ground, 1844. But it became organized at the same time as this was organized. Amazing, isn't it? Moreover, by May of 1888, there was introduced into 
the 50th Congress, a bill prepared by Senator Blair of New Hampshire, designed to secure a nationwide Sunday observance. The original title read, Bill to secure to the people the enjoyment of the first day of the week, commonly known as the Lord's Day, as a day of rest, and to promote observance as a day of religious worship. A hearing was given in the interest of this bill on December 13, 1888. The advocates of the Sunday laws occupying the entire time with one exception. Now, who else was on the boots on the ground at this time? A.T. Jones. A.T. Jones. When did he come into the church? Anybody remember? 1870. He was in the, he was in the Calvary in Walla Walla, Washington. And Brother Van Horn came up there holding evangelist meetings, putting a big tent up, and all the soldiers came out of the fort, fort Walla Walla uh, fortress there, the fort, and they came over to ask him, what in the world's going on here with this big tent? And so Van Horn says, I'll show you what's going on. He opens up this chest and he pulls out this big banner of the metal man, the big man in Daniel 2. Okay? And he says, this is Bible prophecy. Well, that blew Joseph's mind. He was already an historian. And he says, that's in the Bible? He says, that's right. And he attended every meeting and got baptized. And he was baptized there in Walla Walla. And he came out of the water and he says, dead unto the world and alive unto thee, oh my God. He had his hands up in the air. And he hit the ground running, 1875. By 1888, he was there. He was right there at this place. He was dealing with it. The Adventist church wasn't sitting on its hands. It rose to the occasion during those days. Now, here's H. A. H. Lewis, a leading minister and editor among the Seventh-day Baptists, and he was permitted to speak for a few minutes. He weakened his cause, however, by admitting the right of Congress to legislate on this subject, and only asked an exemption in favor of his people. At this point, Seventh-day Adventists who were entirely ignored because they were just a small little group, asked the privilege of a hearing and were allowed about an hour and a half. And here's the guy. A.T. Jones, the, the chief spokesman, made it very clear that Adventists were not seeking an exemption clause, that they would oppose the bill just as much with as without such a clause. Amen. Why? Because they regarded the principle of legislation in behalf of a religious institution as in itself fundamentally wrong. Praise the Lord. Amen. Senator Blair, who presided at the hearing, interrupted the speaker again and again. Some say 90 sometimes, 80, 180 sometimes. I can't remember what the amount is. But he interrupted Jones over and over again. Jones kept his cool and was able to respond to every interruption. And finally, Senator Blair admitted that the argument presented was logical and sound throughout. Now, just, just remember this. This is Adventists. Adventists have been called to meet the occasion. We have light. God's given us light. There are several movements that are taking place at the end of time. One is the United States, the papacy, apostate Protestantism, and Adventism. Only one prevails. We have something to say. We have something to say then. We have something to say now about what's going on. God has wisdom for us, and he's trying to teach it to us by reviewing our history. A report of this hearing was which brought Adventists for the first time somewhat prominently before the National Legislative Body was printed in pamphlet form with additional material on the subject of religious legislation and widely circulated throughout the country. Meanwhile, there were various cases, especially in the southern states, of Adventists being fined for working on their garden and on their fields on Sunday. They were fined for that. And everything pointed to the need of enlightening the general public as to what the principles of religious liberty are. Do you think that needs to be understood today? Yes. yes. See, they're thinking that religious liberty or going to church is not essential. What a liquor store is. Going to, the, going to Walmart is. And it's important to go to Walmart. But how essential is religious liberty? If it wasn't for religious liberty, there would be no civil liberty. 
Religious liberty is fundamental. It's foundational. Without it, there is no freedom. And you'll see this as we develop this. It was in view of these circumstances that Adventists thought it wise to organize an association which should give its particular attention to this one thing. The movement first took shape in the appointment in December of 1888 of a press committee of three for the purpose of devising and carrying out plans for the dissemination of general information to the public on the question of civil and religious liberty. Do you think we should be doing that again? Yes. Absolutely. Now's the time. Brother Aldridge, Brother Duffy, Brother McKee, the members of the committee had much other work to do. And, but they were instrumental in securing a publication of a number of articles and reviews and various papers around the country. In January, McKee was acting as secretary, and he was furnished and assisted by A.F. Bellinger, and the work thus reinforced rapidly, grew in extent and efficiency, and early in February, a new press committee was appointed by the General Conference, consisting of seven members. That was Eldridge Jones, two Joneses, Colcourt, Carlos, and that's uh, Brother James E. White, that's Edson White, and Brother McKee, James' son. The committee organized on the 10th of February and immediately sought the cooperation of various conferences. Adventists got busy. And they were asked to appoint state press committees and select local, local ages as far as possible of all places where a newspaper was published. The members of the committee also engaged in field work. Brother Corliss appeared at the second hearing on the Sunday rest bill before the Senate Committee on Education and Labor. Brother Jones addressing the committees of the legislators in Ohio. He went to the Ohio legislators. He went to Indiana, which, were on, which had under consideration resolutions favoring a religious bill on the state level. Copies of the pamphlet entitled Civil Government and Religion were placed in the hands of all the members of Congress around the country. They were busy. When it was learned that the Arkansas legislator was considering a bill to repeal the exemption clause, Brother Carlos was sent to appear before the committee that had the bill in charge. His representations and the liberal distribution of literature brought about the defeat of that bill. These bills were being defeated by Adventists that were being used of God. In the early summer, lectures on religious liberty were given in a number of large cities of, and reported in leading newspapers. Meanwhile, the need of a larger and more representative organization was making itself felt. Accordingly, the committee drafted a declaration of principles and the constitution of a new body known as the National Religious Liberty Association. It grew. This new organization was brought into being at a mass meeting held at the Tabernacle Battle Creek Church on the evening of July 21st, 1889. They had a constitution there, and it was adopted with laws, bylaws, and the Declaration of its Principles, and the charter members, and here's what they said. We believe in the religion taught by Jesus Christ. We believe in temperance and regard the liquor traffic as a curse to society. We believe in supporting the civil government and submitting to its authority. We deny the right of any civil government to legislate on religious questions. Amen. Amen. Okay? We need to stand, folks. We can, can we say this today as a church? Yes. To the government? Yes. They're telling us we can't go to church. We got friends in other states. They can't go to church because the government said you can't. Are we going to stand? What are we going to do? We believe it is the right and it should be the privilege of every man to worship according to the dictates of his own conscience. Amen. Now that goes for me and you and all of us in this building, in this house of God today. I'm not to prescribe to your duty, and you can't tell me mine. God holds our religious conscience and our liberty very sacred. We also believe it to be our duty to use every lawful 
and our honorable means to prevent religious legislation by the civil government that we and our fellow citizens may enjoy the inestimable blessings of both religious and civil liberty. Those two horns. That's what makes this country great. It's not who was here first. It's not the color of our skin or what culture we came from that made this country great. It's not our sins and our national sins. It's not payback or any of those kinds of things. What it is, is these two amazing principles that come from heaven that has blessed this country. Amen. It's a blessing to be in the kingdom of God. The only planet in the entire universe that has any problems is this one right here. But the rest of the universe is fine. They have peace. They have prosperity. They don't have cancer. They don't have insanity. But we do because there's a devil here. Amen. There was no delay in getting to work, the secretary wrote. A.T. Jones made a lecture tour through Northwest and California with the essential purpose in view of exerting an influence in the constitutional conventions of the states about to be admitted. Over 3,000 newspapers were corresponded with in the 1800s, to more than half of which articles were sent to these newspapers explaining and emphasizing the position of the association of the Adventist Church on the question of religious legislation. When the organization had been in existence for only a year, the vice presidents, secretaries, and press agents in the various states numbered 75. The local press agents were 100. Lectures were being given in many parts of the country, and large mass meetings were held at important centers. They were getting the word out, and God was behind them. Over 1,500,000 pages of reading material had been circulated across the entire United States at that time. Amen. By the small little group of hardly ever heard of Adventists <laughs> that God had raised up. Little Davids and Slim Shots. And 300,000 signatures had been secured to the petition against religious legislation. $1,000 have been spent in defending members persecuted under state Sunday laws. The association took care to be well represented in Washington, D.C., where the fight was on. The Blair Bill, the Sunday Rest Bill, which, whose first appearance was in the 50th Congress, has been related, was presented again before the 51st Congress. Its title being slightly changed so that it didn't seem so religious. In nature, these guys are getting slick. Okay, there was also brought in the Breckenridge Bill, another one. So we got Brother Blair, now we got Brother Breckenridge, compelling Sunday observance in the District of Columbia, Washington D.C. Both measures were successfully opposed by the association. We'll go into more details this afternoon after lunch. And incidentally, much was done in the way of enlightening the general public as to the essential character of Sunday laws. What is the essential character of Sunday laws? Do you think it's all about going to church and worshiping God? No, it's lockdown time. Forcing your conscience. It's forcing your conscience. It's going against your, your, your freedoms that God has granted to us. See, that's where this goes. We're on that path right now. We may not realize it, but there's a version of Sunday law mentality that's being displayed right before our very eyes in this country as well as around the world. Some places it's worse than here. Some states it's worse than it is in Florida. Thank God for the governor that we have here. He's given us a certain amount of freedom. The activities of the association as an organization for the defense of Sabbath keepers who exercise their constitutional right to labor on Sunday were various and exerted a widely felt influence. There was the case of R.M. King, a farmer living in Tennessee, maybe given as typical. At the first annual meeting of the association in the autumn of 1889, word was received of his arrest of breaking a Sunday law. And he was thrown in jail. 
It was the intention to carry the case all the way to the United States Supreme Court. Adventists were being arrested and put in prison, put in jail for breaking the Sunday law. We're getting we're on this path, folks. But Brother King died in the meantime. And in his case, and practically all others, it was aptly proved that the work complained of was done very quietly. Adventists were making a lot of noise on Sunday and could not in any sense be regarded as a disturbance. The chief reason for the prosecution.